Please be seated. A very good evening, venerables, brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Before the commencement of the talk, the Kongming San Pokasi Monastery, Pokashan on Zom, would like to present a composition entitled Tranquility to You. Venerables, ladies and gentlemen, the Zen Age Pokashan on Zom.
Thank you very much to the Zen Age Percussion Ensemble for their delightful performance. Now we would like to invite Fenbo Hyungak Sunun to go upon the stage and take his seat. Please offer three bows to the Venerable. First bow, second bow, third bow. Please be seated. At this point, it is my pleasure to give you a brief introduction to our speaker. Venerable Hyangak Sunim was born in 1964 to a family of devout Catholics in New Jersey, USA. He is currently the head teacher of the Zen Hall at the 500-year-old Hua Gesa Temple in Samgaksan Mountain Range outside Seoul in South Korea. In August 2001, he received the Inca Enlightenment Certification by the Zen Master Sun San, the 78th Patriarch, in a lineage stretching back to Shakyamuni Buddha himself. Educated in philosophy and literature at Yale University and comparative religions at Harvard Divinity School, Venerable Hyangak Sunim was ordained in 1992 in the temple of Nam Hua Sa Temple on Choge Mountain in Guangzhou, People's Republic of China. In fact, he was the first Westerner to be ordained in China since the Communist Revolution. He received his bhikkhu precepts of full ordination at the diamond altar of Tong Do Sa Temple in Korea, one of the most sacred sites in the nation, and has been also doing training in various remote mountain places, including three intensive 100-day solo retreats and some 15 three-month intensive group meditation retreats. He has compiled and edited several of Zen master Sung San's books, including The Whole World is a Single Flower, The Compass of Zen, Only Don't Know, and most recently, Wanting Enlightenment is a Big Mistake. He also translated the 500-year-old classic of So San Desa, The Mirror of Zen, into English for the first time. Venerable Hyangak Sunim is also the author of the Korean bestseller, From Harvard to Hua Ge Sa Temple, which has been one of the best-selling books in the Republic of Korea for the last five years. He leads three-month intensive retreats twice annually and is much in demand as a public speaker throughout Korea, Asia, and many parts of the West. Towards the end of this talk tonight, some time will be set aside for question and answer, so you'll have the opportunity to clear up any doubt you might have then. Without much ado, let us now invite Venable to enlighten us on the importance of finding our true nature. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, Bogaksa, Bogaksa Temple here in Singapore. It's a great honor to come here to this extraordinary center of dharma practice and propagation. This is, without a doubt, one of the greatest temples I have ever visited in my life, and I am very humbled to be here. As our uh, MC has uh, introduced, I came from uh, Hwagesa Temple in Seoul, South Korea, home of a very vibrant and active and ancient uh, Buddhist tradition, especially a Zen meditation tradition. At the International Zen Center, uh, where I live in Korea, there are some 40 foreign monks, uh, 40 non-Korean uh, monks, most of them from the West, uh, practicing uh, meditation in Korea, in addition to, of course, some 15,000 Korean uh, monks and nuns. Our foreign monks and nuns in Korea are from the United States, Poland, Germany, Czech Republic, Russia, Lithuania, Serbia, and nowadays even from Israel, 
we have many, many monks and people who want to become monks from Israel. So I've been living in Korea for 15 years and practicing meditation, doing intensive retreats just for about 20 years. Every year, as uh, our MC announced, we do traditional 90-day intensive meditation retreats, 90 days in the winter, 90 days in the summer. And between those 90-day intensive periods, there's this 90-day period where we can uh, go around and teach and meet with people. During that 90 days of intensive meditation, there is no leaving the temple, there's no newspapers, no TV, no telephones, no internet, no communication with anyone outside the retreat, and of course, no coming and going from the temple. 90 days doing a very strict practice of about 12 hours of meditation every single day without a day off um, and no talking for 90 days. During the last winter retreat, during this past winter, uh, I heard that a visitor was coming to our temple. I heard this, I heard that. It was all the same. This great monk from Singapore who's doing a lot of work in Singapore is coming to uh, Korea and he would be visiting our temple. When the monk arrived and got out of the car, I thought it was a Korean monk. I was looking for a Singapore monk, but I thought it was a Korean monk who got out of the car. I said, where's the Singapore great monk? Where's the Singapore great monk to the people next to me? They said, he's standing right next to you. So that is our great abbot, our Sifu, uh, who practiced in Korea for many, many years, way before me, before I even knew about Buddhism. He was already doing intensive meditation in Korea's uh, elite meditation temple, Songgwangsa, and he has continued to go back there. So we had lunch together, and uh, over lunch we started to talk, and I heard of the great Dharma propagation being held in this great temple. And uh, I noticed his eyes were great bodhisattva eyes and that uh, his work is indeed helping a great effect here. So I came yesterday and I saw for myself the great organization of this temple, the great function, great warmth, and great compassion of the Bogaksa family has really touched me very deeply. And I think that this temple is a great model, an extraordinary model, which I have never seen, I'm serious, that I have never seen before in my life, and which I would like to tell many, many people about when I return to Korea and to the West. The topic of tonight's talk uh, is the importance of finding our true nature. The importance of finding our true nature. Actually, it's a very, very stupid and unnecessary topic if you look at it. It's a very, very unnecessary topic because the importance of finding our true nature should be self-evident. It should not be something which people get together to talk about, or in this case, most of us in this room are hearing about. So why ask this question? Why ask this stupid question? Why talk about this? Why even estimate the importance of finding our true nature? Why? Why? Actually, there are many great Dharma halls. Maybe we can find the answer in this. There are many great Dharma halls here at Bogaksa Temple the 10,000 Buddha Hall, the Precepts Hall, the Patriarchs Hall, the Library, the Sutra Hall, and this great Dharma Hall. Also, what I really like about Bogaksa is lots of dragons. I'm a Yongti, I'm a dragon sign, so lots of dragons. Lots of beautiful halls, lots of dragons. But of all of the halls that I saw today at this temple, of all of the Dharma Halls, at this great temple that really touched me. 
I think the most impressive hall, truly, that really touched me, the most impressive hall and the most impressive architecture at Bogaksa is the crematorium. The crematorium in the back where funerals are held and where bodies are burned three times a day. Also connected to that, the hall where the ashes are stored. If you ask me at Bogaksa, the greatest teaching that I received in all of these great Dharma halls today was in the crematorium in a very short visit. Because there are many, many Dharma halls where teaching is done, where chanting is done, where great performances are done. But I received the greatest Dharma talk today in the crematorium. That is the most true Dharma hall in Bogaksa, in my view. And that is the most important Dharma hall in Bogaksa for any person of any religion. Even if you don't understand Buddhism, even if you're from another religion, even if you don't understand Chinese characters or Sanskrit, the history of Buddhism or meditation, you don't need to go to any other Dharma hall but the crematorium and sit there for five minutes. Then you get the best Dharma talk in Bogaksa. Way better than this talk. Why? Why is that? Because the Dharma talk that you get, that every human being gets from any religion, any human being gets in that Dharma hall is, what am I? What am I? What is this life? What is this that we are engaged in? There's a great poem that comes from ancient Chinese Buddhist literature. Coming empty-handed, going empty-handed. That is the human way. When you are born, where do you come from? When you die, where do you go? Life is like just like a floating cloud which appears in the sky. And death is like a floating cloud that disappears from the sky. Life and death, coming and going, are just like this. But originally, the floating cloud does not exist. Yeah, if you've taken an airplane, the floating cloud does not exist. Life and death, coming and going, are just like that. But there's one thing, there's one thing that always remains clear. It's pure and clear, not depending on life or death. Then, what is this one pure and clear thing? What is this one pure and clear thing? So, the crematorium at Bogaksa can show you that answer. The crematorium at Bo My Dharma talk cannot show you that answer. My Dharma talk is only to point you to the crematorium, actually. Then you get best Dharma speech. You get a living Dharma speech. So, all day, every day, we spend energy chasing and getting catching and losing, many, many, many things. All of our energy is into this body. Every day, how many hours of energy we put into this body? How many hours eating, sleeping, and cleaning this body? How many hours exercising or being worried about not exercising? Hygiene, worry, visits to doctor's office, taking care, maintaining, fixing, this body. But we cannot take it with us. We cannot take this thing with us, no matter how hard we try. 
Also, a Yale degree cannot take it with me. Harvard degree also cannot take it with me. That's a very interesting situation. There's a very interesting story that explains this dilemma. And I tell this story often. It's one of my favorite Dharma stories. I tell this almost every Dharma talk because this story shows the heart of this dilemma. I had a Dharma brother, a monk, very Dharma brother who I respected very, very much, a deep practitioner. His name was uh, Budung Sinim. I tell this story a lot because it really touches me. Madung Sinim was an American monk, American guy, born and raised in Hawaii. But his mother was Chinese and his father was Korean. Born and raised in Hawaii, but from an Asian background, obviously, so Asian features. He's Asian ethnic, but he's born and bred in America, as American as apple pie. Then Mudungsin grew up normal American life, doing things normal American people do. Sports, school, friends, playing around on the beach. But he had a great question. And he started doing meditation and eventually cut his hair and became a monk. So he became a monk. So he had this clothing on and this appearance. Then one day our teacher, Zen Master Sung San, said to him, Mudungsnim, tomorrow a great monk is coming from Korea, very great monk, and he has never seen the United States of America. This is his first time. So when he comes tomorrow, you take him on a little trip, show him Manhattan, show him some Manhattan sites. Okay? So Mudungsnim said, okay. So the next day, Madungsnim went down to Manhattan. And if some of you are familiar with New York City, you know, the most famous tour, the most famous tourism line in all of uh, New York City is something called the Circle Line. The Circle Line Tour. It's a boat tour around Manhattan, Har uh, Manhattan Island. East River, Hudson River, East River, Hudson River, Battery Park, around and around and around and around and around. You get on this boat, you get your camera, you have a hot dog and a Coca-Cola, and you look at Manhattan. It's the best view of Manhattan. So they're going around and around and around on this boat with all the other tourists. Then they notice at the back, they're on the top deck. It's beautiful weather. You know, you can see the Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty. That was 20 years ago, so you could see all the buildings. Then they notice at the back of the boat, at the very, very, very back of the boat, there's a guy holding a camera, big TV camera, kind of for making TV news, and another guy with a microphone. He's holding the microphone like this, and he's interviewing people. They're having like question and answer with people on the boat. They're going up to different people. So Madungsnim and this Korean monk, yeah, they look the same. Yeah? They're both Asian, they both have the same haircut, same hairstyle, and the same clothing. So the interviewing people get closer, 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 closer. Finally, they get close to Madungsnim and they get a big smile on their face because they see these two strange-looking guys, interesting-looking guys, and they think, aha, we have two out-of-country people. This will be very easy and very fun. So they come up to them, and the guy said to Madungsnim, remember, Madungsnim's American, he says, hi, my name is Jim Roberts. I'm Jim Roberts. Channel 56, Channel 56 television comedy program. It's a comedy program. Every week. And every week we have a different program. We have a different question for our viewers on TV. This week's question is, every week we have a different question. This week's question is, in this whole world, what's the most disgusting thing? What's the most disgusting thing? Please tell our TV audience what's the most disgusting thing. And he points the microphone to Madungsnim. And Madungsnim said, Who are you? 
Then the guy said, oh, okay. You probably didn't hear. I'm Jim Roberts, Channel 56, Channel 56 television, comedy show, you know, the Laugh-A-Lot show, very famous show, um, uh, very popular show. And we, every week, different question. Every week, different question. This week question is, in this whole world, what's the most disgusting thing? Points the microphone to Madungsim. And Madungsim said, who are you? And the guy said, oh, okay, I understand. The guy said, I'm Jim, Jim Roberts, Jim, Jim Roberts, channel 56, 5, 6, television, television. You know, maybe your country, you also have this, you know, this, this, this television, te- you know, television. Uh, uh, we are kind of comedy program, you know, <laughs> comedy. That's a l- l- laughing, laughing program. I'm very famous man. Everybody knows me. Every week we have question. This week question. You know, in this whole world, many things. What's the most, what's the most, you know, what, what's, the, what's the most, what's the most disgusting thing? What's the most disgusting thing? And Madungsim said, Who are you? And this guy is really shocked. He said, oh, I, I already told you. It says right here. It says on my shirt. I'm Jim Roberts. Very famous Jim Roberts. And Madungsim said, That's your body's name. That's your body name. Maybe your mommy or daddy give you that name. I don't care about your body name. Before your mommy and daddy give you that name, you had no name. So I ask you, who are you? And the guy said, I am, uh, I am, Mike, stop the camera. I am, I, 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 I don't know. Don't know. And Madungsu said, that's the most disgusting thing. You don't know you. That's the most disgusting thing in the world. So that's a very interesting story. Very interesting story. That whole story is the whole human dilemma. We can do many, 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 many things. Make space shuttle or a little chip that can control an airport. Airport. We can make artificial limb go onto a body that has lost a limb. We can go to space or to the bottom of the ocean. We can understand many, 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 many things. I just heard today, I just saw on the internet, I was checking email, and I saw on the internet, scientists have found another planet that we can live on. It's very interesting. Yeah, we're already looking for another place that we can destroy. <laughs> scientists, it's, it's, it's on, don't believe me, it's on yahoo.com. Scientists have found another planet that has the same temperature and the same conditions as Earth. So we can even find another planet to go to. But we don't know ourselves. We don't know ourselves. So if we don't know ourselves, if we don't know ourselves, then it doesn't matter how much we understand, how much we get, how much we can figure out, how much we can make. If we don't understand ourselves, we're no different from an animal. But if we understand our true nature, if we attain our true nature, our true nature, then we become the very highest of creatures. So, I'm a Zen monk. Zen is very simple. Zen means, Zen is not special. Zen is very simple. Zen means meditation. And meditation means understanding my true self. Understanding my true self. What 
am I? When I was born, where did I come from? When I die, where do I go? Finding that is Zen. Not finding that is what we call sentient being. Sentient being. So every day we say I, 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 I. I am American. I am British. I am Chinese. I am Buddhist. I am Christian. I am happy. I am sad. I am rich. I'm depressed. A few days ago, we had in America a very big incident where a young man, because very, the world didn't understand his I, so he killed 32 people and himself and his family, by the way, and many, many other people because he did not, just did not know himself and other people did not know him. You don't know me. Also, I don't know me. So, so that is this condition of not knowing ourselves every day. I, 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 my, 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 me, 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 me. Many thousands of times every single day. Not only when we're awake, not only with speech. Always going around and 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 around in our head, even when we're asleep. Oh, they don't like me. I don't know. Do they like me? I don't know. Did they do that to me? That was wrong. They don't, they don't understand me. Around and around. I, I, I. My, my, my. Me, me, me. So that's a very interesting situation. Human beings, the most developed of creatures, don't know themselves. And because we don't know ourselves, only because of that, we make suffering for ourselves, suffering for our families, suffering for our communities, suffering for this whole world. Not only this whole world, for all beings suffering. So, what is this I? What is this I? We never give any attention to that. What am I? Descartes caused a revolution in Western thinking. Of course, the Buddha was very, very before him. But Descartes is very known to us today because Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am. I think, I think, therefore, this I exists. I exists from thinking. That was Descartes' revolution. I comes from thinking. Yeah, American thinking makes American I. Korean thinking, Korean I. German thinking, German I. Conservative thinking, conservative I. Radical thinking, radical I. Depressed thinking, depressed I. Thinking I comes from thinking. But where does this thinking come from? Where does this thinking come from? So I think, therefore, I exists. I think, therefore, I am. I think, therefore, this I exists. I totally comes from thinking. But... Before thinking, where is I? So every day we say I, 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 I. But we never look. Who makes I? Who makes this I? Who made that? What am I? So human beings, because we only look outside, because we're only fascinated with our external environment, or when we look inside a little bit, just to look at our own thinking, we only engage in suffering. We only see the surface of the world, as Plato talked about, like living in a cave. Like living in a cave, following the shadows on the wall. That's what our life is. But where does this I come from? When I'm, when I'm born, where does I come from? When I pass into the Bogaksa crematorium, where does my I go? That's why this is the best Dharma hall at Bogaksa. I'm sorry, Abbot, our great Abbot. Many beautiful halls, but in my view, the greatest hall. The one that really has the true essence 
of any great religion. Where does I go? I was, after looking at the crematorium, I went into the, the Napgoldang, where we put the ashes of our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, our children who have left the ashes there. And I looked at the pictures in them. Where is their I now? Whole life worrying about I. Whole life. Some of them 80 years old, 90 years old, some very small. Where is that I now? So if we don't look at that question, we're not any different than an animal. Worried about food, worried about sleep, worried about safety, worried about sex, worried about our own security. But when we turn that question inside, what am I? Then we become a true human being. Actually, all religions point to this. All religions point to this. I know especially because I was raised Catholic, Jesus always points to this. Jesus is also telling us to look at this. The kingdom of heaven is inside. This incredible teaching we get from Jesus also. The kingdom of heaven is inside. So if we only put our attention outside, we're not really looking for the kingdom of heaven. What am I? So very, how important is it to find our true nature? It's not a Buddhist question or a Christian question, not just those. It's a human question. So how important to find our true nature? The Buddha said there are four things. The Buddha said that there are four difficult things in this existence. Four most difficult things to attain. Only four. First one, attaining a human rebirth. To be reborn as a human being is already a huge improbability. It's improbable by the law of averages to be born as a human being. It is improbable, especially if you look at the, the universe. It is improbable to appear on this planet. And then of all of the life forms, all of the billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and trillions of life forms... To be reborn as a human being is the most first difficult thing, the Buddha said. Then one of his students asked the Buddha, how difficult? Can you give us a number? Can you tell us a little more concretely how difficult to be reborn as a human being? And the Buddha said, hmm. Hmm. Imagine all the oceans in the world. All of the oceans, Pacific, Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, the East Sea, the Yellow Sea. Imagine all of the oceans. And there's a turtle, an ocean turtle, swimming under the water. And the turtle comes up one time every 100 years. One time for breath. One time. Imagine that. One time every 100 years. Then imagine there's a yellow, there's, there's, a, there's a circular disc. A circular disc somewhere in the ocean. Somewhere, someone threw it somewhere in the ocean. Millions of miles of ocean. It's a disc. It's a circle with a hole in the center. It's floating somewhere on the ocean. It's not big, only this big. Imagine this disc floating on the waves. And there's a turtle, just a turtle. And the turtle comes up one time every 100 years. Now, imagine the chance that that turtle comes up and through that whole. Imagine how rare it is. The Buddha said, that's how rare it is to become a human being. That's how rare it is. So that's the first difficult attainment. So everyone in this room has attained the first difficult attainment to become reborn as a human being. And not only that, to be re reborn as a healthy human being who has freedom to practice your religion. Many of us 
because we don't really have an awareness of it. Anyone can practice our religion. We can anywhere. But sometimes we don't have interest in it. But all of you came to this talk. So that means some interest, whatever your religion is, it doesn't matter. But you have some interest in self-knowledge. The second most difficult thing is to meet teachings of liberation, to meet the Dharma, to meet the Dharma. So you've met the Dharma. You've come to Bogaksa. You've come to Bogaksa. You've met the Dharma. Dharma means not just Buddhism. It can mean that, but it doesn't mean just, doesn't mean just Buddhism. It means finding teachings to liberate yourself. Finding a teaching to liberate yourself. To liberate yourself. To free yourself. So, all of you have met the Dharma. That's also incredibly difficult. One of the Buddhist students said, how difficult? The Buddha said, imagine a mustard seed. Someone throws it from heaven and it falls to the earth. And someone else is holding a pin. A pin somewhere on the earth. And the mustard seed thrown somewhere in this huge globe goes on the pin. That's how difficult to meet the Dharma and be reborn as a human being. Third most difficult thing is to meet keen teaching, to meet true teaching, to meet a true teaching about looking inside, waking up, and realizing your true nature. That's the third most difficult thing. And I think after knowing Kwang Song Sinim, our abbot, I can say anyone who has met him has also met a clear teaching about liberating yourself, not depending on anything outside, liberating yourself through your own effort, through the teachings. So that's the third most difficult thing. And the fourth most difficult thing is to get enlightenment. The fourth most difficult thing is to get enlightenment. The first one, to be reborn as a human being, to get a human rebirth. The second one, to meet the Dharma. The third one, to meet a keen-eyed teaching, clear teaching, correct teaching. And the fourth one is to get enlightenment. So look at all the life forms in this world, not only human, not only human life forms. Look at all the life forms in this world. Yeah, we think animals are very cute. Animals are very cute. But they can't find their true self. Look at a, a squirrel, the way a squirrel eats. Do you ever notice how a squirrel eats? Not comfortable. Not comfortable. Because the animal knows on its back there's only one word. I am lunch. The squirrel, the squirrel, look at a bird. Not comfortable. Always afraid. Always looking for its enemy. Always unsure. But we are reborn as human beings. We can practice the Dharma, so that's a great benefit. When I first met my teacher, I was a student at the Harvard Divinity School. And I was a very uh, diligent student there. And in my, back, in my back pocket, I had a degree from Yale University in uh, philosophy and literature. And I went and met this teacher, and I said... Uh, sat down, I finally got to meet him, and I said, oh, I understand this, and I want to take Western philosophy and put it together with, uh, with, with Christian philosophy and maybe Eastern philosophy, and I would like to study Middle Eastern philosophy, and I would like to put it all together, and I would like to come up with a kind of hybrid, composite, kind of useful, modern uh, teaching that's scientific, and I, I don't know if I should study a little more Buddhism or if I should continue like this, or I don't know what I should study. And suddenly he shouted at me, Who are you? And I went, Nobody at Harvard talked to me like that. I, I said, I, I don't know. And he said, study that. You don't know. You don't know. 
study that. So Socrates taught the same thing. Socrates. Know yourself. Know yourself. Know yourself. Know yourself. That was Socrates. Socrates taught the importance of understanding your true nature. Know yourself. That's all. He said that the highest value was to know yourself. He didn't have a complex teaching. He didn't teach philosophy. Socrates taught, know yourself. Then one day, one of his students said, Teacher, you always teach us to know ourselves. Do you know yourself? And Socrates said, No. I don't know. I don't know myself. But I understand this not knowing. I don't know. When I look inside, I don't know. I don't know. But this not knowing, this not knowing quality, this not knowing, I know that. I know that. I know that. So when you go to the crematorium and you sit there, what am I? All thinking is cut off. You can't think past the crematorium door. You can't think past it. You can't think what comes next. And when you were born, you can't think past that either. Jesus gave us a great teaching about that. He said, you don't know the time or the hour, the day nor the hour. That's the same teaching as this. So when you look at that, you don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But that not knowing, that's a very great thing. That's our teacher. That's our teacher. So meditation is very, very simple. Meditation just means looking into this not knowing. What am I? What am I? When you ask that, thinking is completely cut off. Thinking is completely cut off. Before thinking arises, that point, that point has no name, no form, has no shape, no size, no color, no quality. Has no religion or country. It's not even a thing. Some people call it Buddha or God or consciousness or the absolute or mind or true self or true nature or spirit or soul. We call it many, many, many things, but it has no name, no form. Human beings call it something attached to that name, then have a problem. But still, it's not that. So any kind of meditation in any tradition means looking at that. There's no birth, no death. Yes, this body, this object, this thing, this container, Appears and disappears, appears and disappears. But what's my driver? What's my driver? What's my driver? Who is my driver? That's a human being's number one job. Everything else is a low class job. Finding my true nature. That's why we have this gift as human beings. No other creature can do it. So, Many, many years ago in Tibet, a great king started to receive these teachings over the Himalayas. And he wanted to know about the condition of what happens after death. He started to receive these teachings from India, the Buddhist teachings, uh, and some of the tantric teachings connected with Buddhism. And he asked uh, some monks to go. He gave them food and, and, and uh, supplies to go to a cave to go to caves in the farthest areas all over Tibet. And he said, come back in 10 years. Do very hard retreat. Come back in 10 years, all of you. Meditate. 
because he heard that some of these monks through meditation can go beyond death, can suspend their heart rate, can reduce their breathing to one time per hour like that. You've all heard about that. So he said, he gave them supplies and said, go away, all of you to separate places. Don't talk to each other and come back in 10 years. Tell me what you found. Tell me what you found. So 10 years, they practiced very hard. After 10 years, the monks were brought back to the capital, brought to the king. And they all reported the same thing. They all reported the same thing. They said that when the body dies, when this object, this container, when this container disintegrates and disappears, our karma is blown around like a leaf. It's blown around like a leaf following the wind of karma, the wind of accumulated mental energy, the wind of accumulated mental energy called karma. Then the king was very astonished. He said, then we have no hope. There's no hope. And they all reported one more thing. They said, no, there is hope. If human beings look inside and find out who owns this karma, who made this karma, who is my driver, we would say. If human beings find that, then this karma doesn't affect you. Then you choose where you go. So that's a very important teaching. So we have a great choice, all of us. We all have come to know about Bogaksa Temple, which is a great temple. And we all have come to know about the Dharma, many great monks here who can teach us. So actually, importance of finding our true nature is, as I said at the beginning, a very stupid question. I'm sorry, we invited you all together here tonight for a ridiculous Dharma talk because it's very, very clear. The importance of our true nature is very clear. No one needs to prove it. But because we get involved in so many things in our head, we forget that. That's why we have this Dharma talk. So that is the uh, conclusion of my one-way Dharma talk. And if anyone has any questions, I would like to uh, engage in a dialogue with you. Thank you very much. Any kinds of questions? We have microphones set up here on the left. Yes. Maybe someone can pass the mic. We've placed uh, microphones along the aisles. So please feel free to uh, go up to the microphones and ask your question. Maybe if someone on this side has a question, you can start to come up and wait so that after he's done, after, after, after him first. Uh, venerable? Yes. Uh, from your talk, uh, I learned that uh, there's so much similarities uh, in the spiritual message. Yeah. When, you, when you talk about uh, Catholics, uh, the teaching is the truth is within ourselves. Yes. Right? And Socrates, know yourself. Yes. Now, my first question is... Uh, could you please let us know why do you choose Buddhism for your personal path? What, one point I what? Why do you choose Buddhism if there's so much similarities in other belief systems? Okay, number two, about liberation. Yeah. Does it mean that could uh, people from other belief systems uh, also, can, can they achieve liberation in the Buddhist sense? if they are not Buddhists? Uh, that's my question. Okay. Your personal choice, and if a person who chooses uh, another religion, yes. can they also achieve 
liberation in the Buddhist sense. So it's like a mountain. All spiritual practice is like a mountain. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All spiritual practice is like a mountain. All spiritual practice is like a mountain. There's a road that goes from the north side of the mountain, a road from the western side of the mountain, a road from the eastern side of the mountain going up, a road from the southern side of the mountain, a road from the southeastern side. Many roads up the mountain. Many. Every mountain has many, many, many roads. When you get to the top, the view is the same. 360 degrees. The view is the same. The roads are different. The northern road goes like this. Maybe takes a long time. Maybe the eastern road goes straight up. Doesn't matter. Most important is to travel the road completely. Then any tradition can lead to the way. Any tradition can lead to that view. The view is the same at the top of a mountain. At the top of a mountain, 360 degrees is the same view for anyone who went up the mountain. Okay? And personal choice? I don't exactly, I didn't understand your speech about personal choice. But we have karma. We have karma. Karma means mind habit. Mind habit. That's karma. Karma is not a special quality or condition. Mind habit. My thinking makes my habit. If I attach to my thinking, I get a habit. If I attach to that habit, I get karma. If I attach to that karma, I get more karma. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Around and around and around and around and around. Now, in that cause and effect, I have free choice. I still have free choice. I still have free choice. But my free choice is affected, is affected by the karma I create. So I create karma, and that karma affects my free choices. Maybe severely limits my free choices, or maybe lightly limits my free choices, but it affects my free choice. If I let go of my karma, in Buddhism, in meditation, if you really meditate, actually you see your karma is empty. Karma is fundamentally empty. It has no nature. When you think your karma is real, it affects you. When you do meditation and you see the substance of karma, the substance of thinking, the substance of mind is fundamentally empty, fundamentally empty, at its, you don't make it empty, that mind is empty, then this karma cannot affect you. Then your free choice is unhindered, no hindrance. Okay? So, free choice, we make karma. If we attach to desire and anger and ignorance, we make karma. Then that karma begins to control our free choice. Like a wind blowing on a moving object. But, if you're just following your karma, your karma controls you. Your karma controls you. Then many kinds of actions appear. Like this boy, I use this example only because it's very simple. This boy in Virginia of last week, very simple, just an American boy in Virginia. He had some thinking. He believed his thinking was real. He followed his thinking then made more karma for him and all people around him. In Buddhism, we say that that karma now really affects him. Now his free choice, his consciousness is pulled down even heavier by the karma he made. Yet yeah, he still has free choice. If he appears in this world again, 
and sees that his karma is empty, he's free. But chances are, attached to the energy that he created, it will continue to pull down and continue to pull down and continue to pull down. The word for that is hell. Okay? So, attach to your karma, make more karma. But see your karma is empty, fundamentally empty, fundamentally empty. It's like when you have a dream. In a dream, a tiger is chasing you from behind, a big, hungry tiger, big tiger. In the dream, you think the tiger is real. You think it's real. It's coming behind you and you're running really, 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 really fast to get away, trying to get away from this tiger. You're not really moving fast enough. The tiger's getting closer, and you're sweating, and you're screaming, and you're desperate, and you're falling down, and you get up, and you, keep, and you, you wonder if you're going to die. Then when you wake up, when you wake up from the dream, you see, oh, 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 this is my bed. This is my clock. This is my room. The tiger wasn't real. When you thought the tiger was real, the tiger affected you. But the whole time, the tiger was not there. The tiger was completely empty. So when you wake up and you see that the tiger is empty, that it was a dream, then no more running. Then no more running. So karma is exactly like that. Any kind of karma is just a dream. Created by thinking that you're attached to. When you let go of the attachment, you see karma is empty, then you're free. Okay, that's a Buddhist teaching on that. Okay, yes, over here. Um, Venerable, I'd um, like to clarify his uh, question. I think he was uh, trying to ask um, since all these various uh, religions are similar, why did you choose Buddhism oh. as your personal choice? Why I chose Buddhism? That was my karma. <laughs> wow, that was, I could have done it a lot easier. <laughs> okay, yes, this lady here. I chose Buddhism because I knew that I had to find inside. I had to, Buddhism has a very clear technology. It has a very clear technology, we can say. A technology for finding my nature. And all religions teach it too. Buddhism is not special in that way. All religions teach it. That's why anyone in any religion can find it. But for me, for me, Buddhism had the technology that fit for me to sit down and to look inside and to say, what am I? Because before, with scholarly education and academic education, always looking outside, always looking outside, read this, read this, read this, read this, study this, read 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 this, but no truth. Then Buddhism said, look inside, sit down, follow breathing, keep question. There's a technology, almost a technology. So I wanted to practice that. Yes, over here. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank yes. you, uh, Venerable, for a most liberating talk. Uh, my question, uh, there are two questions. The first one is, I take reference from the uh, management concept of Johari window. In the Johari window, there are four quadrants. One is, I know me. Other people don't know. No. Yeah. The other one is, other people don't know. Uh, other people know me. I don't know myself. Then there's another cool quadrant that I know me, other people also know me. Hmm. So the last quadrant of I don't know myself, other people also don't know me. So I'm wondering if that is the case, it will be a waste that we will go through life not knowing know what would we really, the real me. Yes. So can you enlighten us on that? So, who are you? I don't know. Okay, that. That, just, just that point, don't, 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 don't think about it, don't think about it. Who are you? I don't know. Good, that. Look into that. Really, you don't know. 
You don't know. Look into this not knowing something. Look into it. Not conceptually, not in your head, not intellectually. Can your eyes see your eyes? Can your eyes see your eyes? In a mirror. No, no, no mirror. I mean right now. No mirror here. Can your eyes see your eyes? No. No. Can your ears hear your ears? Yes. Oh, yeah? I would like to hear what that sounds like. <laughs> your eyes cannot see your eyes, yeah? But you have eyes. Your eyes, you cannot confirm, you cannot confirm that you have eyes by seeing them. But you have eyes. Same way. I don't know. I don't know what I am. I don't know. But there's something. There's something. Don't call it anything. Don't name it. Don't name it. Look at it. Just look at it. Don't analyze it. Don't describe it. Don't worship it. What am I? That's all. Then. One day, boom, it opens up. That's all. Okay, so you can't get there by understanding. You can't get there by understanding. You can't. That's why Jesus gave this incredible teaching when he said, to enter the kingdom of heaven, become as a child again. It's such an incredible teaching. It's not understanding. Salvation, true knowledge, and wisdom, they don't come by understanding alone. Rather, what am I? Look at that. That's all. So, who are you? My mother's daughter. Your mother's daughter. <laughs> I think you lost it. You were better about five minutes ago. <laughs> okay, that, that was the joke. Yeah, okay. Over uh, here. Sorry, I yeah. don't mind very not, quickly. Yeah. Because just now, I take reference from the questions the two speakers were asking you. So, have you uh, feel that you have been mis misunderstood? Sorry? Uh, yeah. No, very often we feel that other people misunderstand us. Yeah. So for yourself, in your opinion, do you feel that you have been misunderstood? Of course. So this is a human problem. How to resolve yes. that? It's not based on understanding. Not understanding. But the conflict always comes about due to that. Yes, and it always will. So there's no answer. <laughs> my, my, my teacher, Zen Master Sung San, said something interesting. He said, it's connected to this. I like, this is really shocking. I just heard about this about a year ago. He said, world peace is not possible. He said, world peace is not possible. Now, this is a Zen master who every day said, world peace, world peace, meditation, world peace, world peace, world peace. Then one day he said to a student, he said, world peace is not possible. Also, not necessary. <laughs> because it's here. We're waiting for world peace to happen. Then we'll be happy. The real thing, you know, Coca-Cola, the real thing. Yeah, the Coca-Cola is the real thing. I love it. The real thing 
It's not based on world peace or not. It's not based on understanding. What am I? So there's many different people in this room. Buddhist, Christian, maybe Hindu, maybe Muslim, maybe Chinese, maybe British, maybe French, maybe men, maybe women, maybe American, maybe this, maybe this, maybe many, 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 many kinds. All understanding. Some people with PhD, education, no education, some education, but... In that moment, everyone's experience is the same. It's not based on understanding that moment. Your mind, 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 your mind. It's the same point. You don't get there by understanding. You don't get there by understanding. It's just. that moment, everyone's mind is the same mind, everyone here. Understood me? Misunderstood me? <laughs> it's not that. Okay. Okay, thank you for yeah. the great Dhamma. Thank you. Yes, so sir. let us um, yeah, have our friends waiting on uh, the side. Teacher, please enlighten me. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Ah, this water is cool and delicious. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Venerable. Hello, Venerable. Uh, some say that... Loud, some, loud. Some say that the original nature is something like space. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the... Nothing that can be seen is called true seeing, that nothing can be heard. I cannot, I cannot hear you at all. <laughs> Speak to in, the mic. into the mic. Okay. Uh, some say that origin of nature is something like space, that nothing can be seen, which is called true seeing, that nothing can be known as true knowing. Nothing that can be seen is called uh, true, true seeing. seeing, and then there is nothing that can be known. known. As that true, is true, true knowing. Mm. Uh, in our daily lives, we come across a lot of phenomena that arises and pass away all the time, every day. So in our daily practice, how could one practice this true seeing and not and true knowing? Okay. Thank you. Say it. Right, so you're saying that in our lives we see things arising and then passing away. So then how do we uh, practice true seeing and true knowing? Like this. How many fingers do you see? Five. How many fingers? Three. How many fingers? One. How many fingers? None, yeah. As it is. Yeah, practice just like that. Just as it is. Just as it is. Don't attach. When you hear the bird sound, just hear the bird sound. It's like a mirror. That's why Buddhism always compares our true nature to a mirror. Our mind, our nature, our fundamental nature, no matter what our nationality or religion, all of us, our fundamental nature, it's like a mirror. If something comes in front of the mirror, the mirror reflects it as it is. And when it disappears, it disappears from the mirror. And when something else comes in front of the mirror, a different color, it's reflected a different way. When it disappears, it disappears. Ah! You perceive that, and then it's gone. But human beings hold their thinking. Hold our thinking. 
We hold our thinking. That person, I don't like them. What a jerk. Well, why did they say that to me? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. That, well, that's because they don't do so much. Well, they're stupid. Well, they didn't go to school. I went to school. Well, they were not. I don't know. I'm going to go home. I'm gonna, what am I going to watch on TV then? I'm not going to watch TV anymore. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to watch TV. One more time. I'm going to rent it. Maybe I'll get a DVD. DVDs are expensive. What DVD? Maybe two DVDs. I left my DVD. We hold our thinking. We just, we hold our thinking so we suffer. Because we think our thinking is real. So we hold our thinking. But when you just perceive this world as it is, how many fingers do you see? Say it. How many fingers? How many fingers? None. How many fingers? One. Good. Good eyes, too. (laughs) Just like that. Just like a mirror. Boom. 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 No attachment. No hindrance. When you see, just see. When you hear, just hear. When you smell, just smell. When you taste, just taste. But when you hold your thinking, you don't perceive this world. My teacher used to say something very interesting. He used to say, when you're thinking, when you are thinking, you lose your eyes. True. Yeah. Did you ever, when you're driving, you know when you're driving on the road, you're driving, you're like, okay, I got to go here, I'm going to make a right turn. Oh, I got to go home. I don't want to clean my house. Why doesn't my mother help me? I don't know. Why don't I get to go? I don't want to go. I don't want to go see that stupid person. I have to do all this work. Ah! You're, you're driving. But when you follow your thinking, you're not seeing. Your friend is talking to you. When you're, your friend is talking to you and you're thinking, Oh my God, this is such a stupid, he always talks about this, I don't know, when am I going to, when I get home, all right, this is the last time I'm talking about this, stupid, he should talk to someone else. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. When you're following your thinking, your ears are on, the button is on, the switch is on, but you're not hearing. That's why Jesus had this great teaching for humanity. He said, you have eyes. The student said, why do you teach us these stories? They're so confusing. And he said, you have eyes but you don't see. You have ears, but you don't hear. It's the same teaching point, point. He's pointing to the same thing. Our nature is already fundamentally clear. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't need anything. It's already complete. Complete. We follow our thinking, attach to our thinking, make more thinking, analyze, split our thinking, follow this thinking. I don't know, what should I do? (laughs) Round and round and round. So we can't see clearly, we don't hear clearly, we don't smell clearly, we don't taste clearly, we don't live clearly. So it doesn't mean stop thinking. It just means meditation. If you do meditation, you see that thinking is empty, fundamentally empty. So you don't follow it anymore. When you don't follow your thinking, then you can see clearly, you can hear clearly, you can smell clearly, you can taste clearly, you can feel clearly, you can be clearly. Then you and the universe are never separate. You and the universe are never separate. Then when a thirsty person comes, you can give them some water. When a hungry person comes, you can give them some food. When someone is in jail or needs clothes, you can give them your clothing. You can go to jail visit them. Boom, boom, boom. You can just function with this world. But when you follow your thinking, you and this world are separate. Okay? So, how many fingers? (laughs) Go. Five. Good. How many fingers? Four. Good. Keep that mind. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, Good evening, uh, Venerable. Yeah. Just now you uh, enlightened us about the difficulty as uh, there's four difficulties in our life, which is uh, to be born as human, to listen to Dharma, to get the proper teaching, and uh, to gain enlightenment. So perhaps you could share with us what's a various step perhaps we could done in today's life to ensure that uh, perhaps we be, have a similar chance to be reborn as human again. I mean, I see, what's the so various, various proper way that we could do now as a 
how be reborn again as a human being? Yes. How? Um, I mean, for my little understanding, I mean, there's a few steps which is perhaps you can enlighten me, which is for uh, taking refuge, cultivating six parameters, yeah. and uh, basically meditation. Was yeah. that uh, is a correct order in that way? Oh, yeah. Right, so you're asking, how do we ensure that in a future life, we are, again gain right, these uh, four difficult things that are very uh, difficult to attain? Yes. Right? And then you mentioned uh, practices such as uh, taking refuge in the yeah. triple gem, the six parameters, meditation, and so on. Would this be sufficient enough to ensure that we have a better, uh, let's say, another opportunity? Yeah, I have a faster way. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Quick! Who am I? Yeah, who are you? You I'm don't know, yeah? I, have, I was given a name by my parents. Huh? Yeah, I, I don't care about name. that. Yes. <laughs> who am I? My true self has yet emerged because I've been tainted by all the defilement in the huh? daily life. <laughs> Too complicated. Yes. Who are you? Is yet to emerge. Huh? Yet to be found. Hey. Too complicated. Who are you? When you were born, where did you come from? When you die, where do you go? Pardon me? <laughs> Again? Put it down. You don't know yourself, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that. How should I look at that? Through meditation? Who are you? Who are you? Myself. Myself? Who said that? I call myself. I, 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 myself, myself. Yes. You're a shadow talking about a shadow. Who are you? Don't know. Don't know yet. Yeah, you give lots of words to it, but inside you don't know. Look at that. When you're meditating, when you're eating, when you're chanting, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme. Who is doing Om Mani Padme? Who is doing it? When you're chanting Omi Tofu, Omi Tofu, Omi Tofu, Omi Tofu, Omi Tofu, Omi Tofu, Omi Tofu. Who is doing Omi Tofu? That is how you do it. If you keep that question, then your thinking is always completely cut off. In the beginning, you just experience it very short. But as you keep practicing, 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 it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. Actually, it doesn't get bigger or smaller. It has no size. This is just talking. But your faith in your before thinking mind, your before thinking mind, okay? You can't understand it, just do it, okay? Try it, okay? Don't believe me, try it. Next. Evening, sir. Yes. Um, pardon me, but I'm going to ask you an intellectual question here. Sure. Thinking, um, I, I earn a livelihood by teaching philosophy to high school students. Uh -huh. um, and interestingly, about three weeks ago, we were talking about consciousness. So we, I brought up Descartes, I brought up um, Jean-Paul Sartre, mm. the whole concept of transcendental ego. And then today, I am listening to you talking about you can't see the seeing eye. The, yep. So my question is, um, how can we ever know? This self, because if I think about myself talking to you right now, mm. I'm not the same speaker. I'm, yes. It's transcendental ego, the dark ego that yes. you can never catch up with. Yes, yes. I want to hear from you. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not Buddhist, I'm agnostic, but um, through meditation, how do you catch up with this driver of your consciousness? How can you know the self? Yes. What's the difference between thinking about it intellectually okay, and meditation? Okay. I'll give you. Who are you? I really? Agree. This is really it? Yeah. You want a different flavor? I mean, like Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors? You know, it's all ice cream. I like Baskin Robbins. They sell the same icy water. But because there's a purple color and a pink color and a yellow color and a green color, we go and buy this one, we go 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 buy this one. But it's all ice milk water. Who are you? I'm listening. No, but who's the I that said that? 
Who? What? It's the mind. The mind? Before the mind, I know you're going to ask that. <laughs> you have mind? And memories. Hey, show me your mind. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Why not? You have a shirt. Do you have mind? No. No, you don't have mind. <laughs> so, you don't know. You say, mind said that. Then one second later, say, well, I don't have mind. So, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's how you do it. You don't know. Your thinking only goes to here. Philosophy only goes to here. It can only go to here. But when you ask, what am I? That thinking that's cut off, if you look, so your question was, how can we know the self? We can't know the self. Your eyes cannot see your eyes. I said it before. Yeah. You, your mind cannot know your mind. It's like a shadow shaking hands with a shadow. It's not possible. But if you ask, what am I? Don't know. You don't know. Socrates also don't know. But Socrates had insight in this not knowing. Okay? Like that. So don't, you're trying to approach it from understanding. I appreciate that. But you know what? You're wasting your time. I mean, you can keep trying if you like. <laughs> no, no I, I know. Be we, my guest. <laughs> uh, not on my time, though. <laughs> Ask, what am I? Really? You know what I really appreciated about my teacher was he didn't encourage me to do more thinking. Mm. He wasn't proud of me as his little Harvard student. He completely cut it off. He said, who are you? None of my Harvard professors talked to me like that. So I, I, I went, I don't know. I don't know. Then he said, look at that. Look at that. And when I looked inside and looked at that, it's infinite. It's infinite. It's infinite in time and space. Truly. It's not even a thing. Has no birth, has no death. It's infinite. Do you like that? Try it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Over here. Um, I have been attending Dharma classes since the uh, past decade, and I'm truly, truly sold on the theory of karma. Um, and, and I've picked up on this and in my encounters with many people over the past years. I tell them, it don't matter what religion you were born into, you can remain there. Um, because all religions tell you, um, uh, proper, you know, they tell you, be good, do good. There's no religion which condones that, be bad, do bad. Um, so, so what's your question? So my question is, can you um, um, give me some affirmation on this? Affirmation on what? Um, and, and also the, uh, I also tell people, the fact that I'm talking to you today, or whoever it is, it is the karmic connectivity that has brought us together. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may be from the other side of the world, but it was this karmic connectivity that brought us briefly together. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Good, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Over here. So I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you. I have some questions. Um, when you say, who are you? Can you say that we are all souls and spirits? I mean, if no. man is body, mind, soul, so we are not mind, we're not body, so we are soul. Is that correct? And, um, one last question. Um, how do you define success? Thank you. 
Is it mind or soul? Mind, that's your question, that mind or soul. This is water in here, water, water. They put water in my cup, water, okay. In uh, Korea, it's called mul, mul. In German, it's called Wasser, Wasser. En français, it's called le, le, Wasser, mul, water. What is it in Chinese? Sweet. Yeah. Many names, many names, many names. Name, 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 speech. But that's not, none of those names touch this, my friend. None of those names have any, this, ask this. Are you water? <laughs> Are you Wasser? Are you Le? Are you Mul? I'm, wait, I'm going to wait for the answer. You want to understand things through words. Is it soul or mind? Words and speech cannot touch it, just like words cannot touch what this is. But if you ask me if it's water or mul or wasser, like your, if, like your question, is it soul or mind, I say, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, then, Venerable, um, Singapore, it's very important to have uh, material wealth and intellectual wealth. Yeah. Um, do you agree that this is the definition of success? And also, what is the meaning of life? Okay. Wow, many questions. Soul, mind, success, meaning of life. You're asking all the biggest questions. Okay, success, many kinds of success. There's many kinds of success. Million, million kinds of success. But as a human being, true success is self-knowledge, finding true self. True self. In any religion, something. Human being, truly being human. Truly being. It's nature, okay? Not an animal. Not animal behavior. So, many kinds of success. But the deepest, the most permanent, the most long-lasting, the most beneficial success, the most successful thing is when a human being attains human nature. And you can do that by making money. You can do that while being an actor. You can do that while being an artist. You can do that while going to church. You can do that while going to the temple. You can do that while being in the mosque. You can do that in many. That's not important. Most important is attaining that then everything is successful. Then everything is successful. But human beings have a very narrow view of success. Objects, things, names, labels, values. That's a kind of small success. I went to Harvard. Small success. So what? Someday I have to go to the crematorium. How can my Harvard degree help me then? Oh, but I'm lucky, because I went to Harvard and Yale. Now I'm really ready for the crematorium. No problem. That's really going to help me. Maybe I'll, go, maybe I'll move to Singapore and go to SMU. Harvard, Yale, SMU. Then no problem, crematorium. Can't help. Okay, so that's a kind of success. But for human beings, true success is attaining my true nature. Meaning of life? M meaning of life? <laughs> what are you doing right now? Listening to Dharma. What are you doing right now? Answer me. Huh? Me hey, talk. What are you doing? And? Talking. Uh, yeah, what kind of talking? Sports? We're we talking about the weather? Talking about the Dharma. That's the meaning of your life. Okay. So please okay. Uh, limit uh, your yeah. question to just yeah, one, yeah. Question one question per person. person. Many yeah, people. So that this more side. people get the chance yeah, to over. Uh, this side, this side. Sorry. I can't uh, yeah, hear. okay. Sorry, can I try the answer, the question of who are you? Yes. If I answer, 
I am nothing. Oh. Am I close to the answer? Huh? I am nothing. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Is that close to the answer? Close to it. Nothing is still something. <laughs> okay. Okay. At least it's closer. Okay. The... If, you're, if you're true nothing, if you truly believe you are nothing. true nothing... It is the answer. Wait. If you were really believe that... You would answer like that. But if you say, I'm nothing, that's something. So it doesn't make okay. sense. One, one last question, very quick one. Yeah. Uh, how do you know you are progressing through your meditation? How do you know you are making progress? I'm not progressing. By knowing that you're not progressing? No, I'm not progressing. There's no progress in meditation. There's no progress. No, there's no progress in meditation. Sorry. You know, this is not like, uh, you know, being a race car driver. No, there must be some physical No, sign. no Be progress. Sorry. My, you, my uh, own yeah, 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 just, just, just a second. Have you ever chanted the Heart Sutra? Shimgyong, Banya Shimgyong, Maha Banya Baramita Shimgyong? No, sorry, I'm not. The Heart Sutra in Chinese, yet. how do you say? Xin Xin. Yeah. No attainment. There's no attainment. I, wait, wait, I, wait, 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 wait. Please, everyone is so ready with their ideas in life. That's why human beings have so much trouble. Wait, wait just wait. No attain. This is Heart Sutra. No attainment with nothing to attain. So no progress either. You know, okay, maybe the word progress is wrong, but what I'm seeking are signs. Huh? For example, I notice. If you meditate, there's a deep happiness that comes up within you. So, these, are these the sign that I'm saying, that I'm asking? These no. are the answers. No. Not, are you saying there's nothing at all? Show me something. <laughs> the Show happiness, me you... as I was saying, the happiness that you encounter. Well, that's is... speech. No, Show... it's a feeling that you Okay, feel. okay, put it down, put it down, put it down. <laughs> put it down. Just put it down. You want something. You want something. But it's not that. I agree, I agree. But yeah. what I'm saying is that shouldn't be there some sign to, to tell you. No sign. Nothing at all. No, no. Wait, don't believe me. Read the Heart Sutra. Okay. Chant the Heart Sutra. Thank no you. attainment with nothing to attain. Okay, over here. Um, it seems that the ultimate loud, a little loud, um, closer. Um, it seems that the ultimate ending to all of us, actually all beings, is to reach the enlightenment, hmm. and from there um, go out of the karma, be liberated from the karma. Am I right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, may I know if there is an answer to how did we get into karma itself? In um, it seems like um, we are in a vicious cycle from which we have the benefit of becoming human once, um, mm. as you said, the improbable even. And then um, we have the ability to think and from there reach enlightenment. Um, but where did, where did all the process before that come about? Where did all the process for that come about? How did we get into the karma itself? Or How were we forever there until we get to the ending. Karma just comes from thinking. When one thought appears, when one thought appears, if you hold that thought, karma begins. That's all. And how you get out is in meditation. When thinking arises and disappears in meditation, if you look, just look. Don't believe me. Don't believe anything I'm saying. Please. See for yourself. When you sit in meditation and you look, thinking appearing, staying, and disappearing. If you look, you see 
that thinking actually never appears and never disappears. Right now you're going. Thank you very much. No, wait, wait, wait. You have to look. That's how you get out. My explanation doesn't get you out. But this. See this? This. 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 You have to look yourself. The Buddha said to his disciples, my teaching cannot, my teaching itself cannot get you out of suffering. You must do it. You must try it. Then you get out of suffering. It's like a doctor. The doctor writing a medicine. There. That prescription cannot get you out of suffering. Oh, five times a day after meal, 30 minutes. Great. Then you put it away. But still hurt. Then, oh, take this five times a day, two times with meals, three times a day, 30 minutes after eating. Great. Still hurting. Then take it out. Well, it says here, take five times a day. After 30 minutes after meal, take this with a cup of cold water. Great. The prescription cannot take away your suffering. You have to do it. You have to take the medicine yourself. Then you see, is this medicine correct or not correct? So how do we get out of karma? Not by understanding how to get out of karma. Do it. So who are you? Who are you? A thought process. A thought process. Can you show me your little thought process, please? I can feel the process, but I don't know the origin. Uh, you have to show it to me. Give it to me. You can't, yeah? Yeah, it's just thinking. You think thought process, so you have thought process karma. So just when you follow, you think that thought, oh, thought process. I think it's real, so I say it, then I, then I just made karma. But when that thought arises and disappears, when you look at the origin of that thought, when you look at it, the origin, where did that thought come from? Don't look at the thought. That's what we do. We look at the thought. Oh, I don't like him. What a jerk. I don't know. He's stupid. Well, that's because he's dumb. He's stupid. He never liked me. We look at the thoughts. But true practice means who thought that? Instead of following the thoughts and getting confused, we follow the thoughts like an object because we think it's real. But this teaching means where did the thought come from? Who am I? When you look, no thought arises. When you look, no thought arises. You know, Buddhas, Buddhas and sentient beings are exactly the same. Only one difference. Sentient beings follow their thinking. Follow. They think their concepts, their thinking, their ideas, they think they're real. Their feelings, their memories, what happened last week, what they said, what they said to me, what they didn't do. They, they think that those things are real, so they follow them into suffering. But a Buddha doesn't follow his thinking or her thinking. That's the difference. Has thinking, doesn't attach to thinking. Sees that thinking is empty. That's all. So you can't understand it. You have to do it. Okay? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right, so just to save time, maybe we have this gentleman first. Yeah, huh? we'll yeah, over here please. while we... Yeah. Uh, dear Venerable, thanks for your time today. Yeah. So my question is, so what is real? Huh? huh? So what is real since you say that thinking makes it real? What is real? What is real? <laughs> How many fingers? Five. Good. What color is the ceiling? Uh, white. Good. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Is that real? 
Is that real or not real? I ask you. Sorry, what is real, what is not real? How many fingers do you see? Five. What color is the ceiling? White. Is that real or not real? I ask you. Yes, yes, that's real. Oh, you made a mistake. You ask me if that's real or not real. Yes. <laughs> Five fingers, the ceiling is white. Do you understand? Here. Don't make real. Don't make unreal. Okay? Don't make real. Don't make not real. How many fingers do you see? Five. What color is the ceiling? White. Good. Keep that mind. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Real is just thinking. Unreal is also just thinking. Yes. The subject on rebirth, has it been scientifically proven or is it a human created belief? Very good question. Scientifically proven? Well, I can prove it for you. Scientifically, everything is going around and around and around and around. We know that. All matter, all material, all substance, around and around and around and around again, around and around. Here's water. I drink this water. It's all gone. Water's all gone. Yeah, it's gone. Water's gone, right? The water's gone, right? Right? Water's gone? Yeah, it's just by sight. Yes, you're correct. Because it still is. You can't see it. But it is. And even though it's gone... And you can't see it. You know what? If you come to the bathroom with me in about 30 minutes, <laughs> scientifically, this is, this is, you know, science doesn't need machines and laboratories and electrical wires. Scientifically, if we go to my room, I go to the bathroom, we can test it. We can with pH paper. Now, this is you know, science. You know, you want science. I'm giving you science. You know, science is... You can test it, and it will have the same pH balance as Bogaksa water. Okay? So, it's the same, but it's a little bit changed. <laughs> Color, sight, smell. Okay? So, everything is just like that. All energy, all matter, all substance, these flowers... This table, this building, this ground, it's all changing, 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 changing. Around and around and around. We know that. If you burn a body in the crematorium, the body is gone, right? But carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, zinc, copper, it goes around and around into the atmosphere goes up, becomes part of the clouds, becomes part of the trees, the rain, tree. Like a, le a tree. Leaf falls down into the ground, goes into the ground, becomes nutrient, becomes the tree. Around and around. Consciousness is the same thing. All energy is like that. All energy. We know that. We know that. Around and around and around. So, I've scientifically proven rebirth. <laughs> it's instructive. It's not definitive, but it is instructive. Okay, so the, the teaching of rebirth is not Buddhist teaching. Which means it was not created by the Buddha. Before the Buddha, there was rebirth. Substance was still going around and around. But he saw it. 
He was the first person to clearly see it and say it and say that the laws of the universe, the laws of all matter, the laws of all substance, the laws of all material are also the laws of my mind, the way my mind goes. That's all. He was the first one to clearly, scientifically, in that way, say it. But he didn't create that teaching. So, can it be said that it's human-created? Sorry? It's human-created theology. Eh? Human-created what? Is the origin human-created? No, I said? mean, it's a human-created belief from, inch, from times immemorial. I see. It's rebirth. A yes. human created belief. I don't know. I really don't know. You know, Buddha used to not answer. The Buddha didn't answer certain kinds of questions. Or, you know, he didn't. You know, they would ask him. One question was, uh, what is the origin of the universe? And the Buddha would go. <laughs> then the question would say, uh, teacher, I'm asking, what is the origin of the universe? Then a third time. Uh, what is the origin of the universe? Then he would say, my teaching is really not concerned with that question. My teaching is concerned with suffering, the fact that we all suffer. My teaching is concerned with that. My teaching is concerned with the fact that suffering has a cause. It's very important. It's like a doctor. It has a, it's not magic. It's not an accident. It's not some heavenly situation. Suffering has a cause. Third thing is, my teaching is concerned with we can get out of suffering. And my teaching is concerned of eightfold way to get out of t suffering. That is what my teaching is concerned with. I am not concerned with speculative questions. He, was, he never held himself out to be a god in that way. So he also said about his teaching, and I offer this to you, to everyone here actually. The Buddha said, this world, it's like a person shot with a poison arrow, a poison-tipped arrow. Suddenly, shh, and all our life we're going, who shot that arrow? I wonder how big he is. Is he five foot two? Maybe he's two meters tall. Is he a big person? or Does he have a short hair, hair down to here, or hair like this? Maybe here, does he have something in his nose like this, or something like that? What kind of person? What kind of wood is this? Is this oak or cherry? Maybe this is lime wood. Maybe this is linden wood. What kind of tree did it come from? Did he shoot it? Was he a tall man? What did he have for breakfast today? Did he have an omelet today? Maybe he had oatmeal. Maybe he had congee today. I don't know. What did he do? What is his, what is his name? I wonder what his favorite baseball team is. Around and around and around and around and around. And the Buddha said... Are you still listening? <laughs> Sorry. And the Buddha said, the Buddha said, my teaching is not concerned with that way of getting out of suffering. My teaching is take the arrow out. But all of us, our whole lives, we're sitting there trying to intellectually figure out the arrow. Who shot it? Why? How big they are? What color is their skin or their hair? How long? What do they do? What is this? Where did it come from? What kind of wood? What kind of, what kind of feather? Is this an eagle feather? Maybe it's a pigeon feather. Maybe it's a small. Is it a female pigeon feather? Or maybe it's a male pigeon feather. Like spotted pigeon feather. Meanwhile, the poison is going into our heart. So the Buddha said, everyone is just like that. But he said, my teaching is a little bit different. My teaching is, take the arrow out then you don't die. So, what's the origin of the universe? The Buddha was like. Human beings. <laughs> anyway, I suggest, that's the end of the talk. Uh, if this talk still doesn't satisfy you, there's another place you can go for a teaching, much better than this talk. Go to the crematorium. <laughs>
and sit there. It's not depressing. It's actually a very beautiful experience because our life, it shows us just moment. Just moment. Just moment. So we think past, present, future. But there's no past. Where's the future? Also, we say present. Present! It's already past. Present! Past. It became the past. No past, no present, no future. But we do have one thing. We have moment. This moment. Moment. Moment to moment to moment to moment. That's our true life. Okay? So everyone, thank you for coming tonight to Bogaksa in the rain and in your busy lives. Uh, please, even 10 minutes every day, even just 10 minutes meditation, no matter what religion you believe, every religion has this component. 10 minutes looking inside. What am I? Don't analyze it. Don't figure it out. Don't stop your thinking. That's not what it's about. If you ask, what am I, all thinking, it's completely cut off. That point, before thinking arises again. That's your true nature. That's enlightenment. That's our true self. So thank you everyone for coming tonight, and uh, see you again. So on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to uh, thank Benbow uh, for his uh, very, very precious and uh, fascinating insights on the Dharma. And I'd like to also thank him for his very insightful answers to our various uh, questions. Thank you very much, Benbow. So please rise to see Venable off.